Today, let's put a hole through your wall using Blender. First, I'll show you the basic scene setup. Finally, in compositing, we'll harness the power of object masks and render passes to improve our VFX workflow. Let's begin. First, I wanted to show you this. Now, this is my awful first attempt at this effect, but hopefully this is encouraging for you to know that I start out each of these tutorials with a similarly awful result. I spend a lot of time developing the final look you see in these videos, and even then, it's still not perfect. Here's an overview of this video and what we'll cover. Now, if I start by filming a blank wall, it'll be very hard to motion track this footage, so I taped some tracking markers to the wall to help with this. Now, if we track the footage, everything seems to go well, but if we add an object to act as our floor, you'll see the track is really bad in the distance. This is because when we film a flat surface like this wall, the camera tracker has a hard time knowing if the camera is rotating around or if it's actually moving around. We can help avoid this by filming footage that includes not only our wall, but things in the foreground and background. Now our footage has more parallax, and you'll see now that our distant 3D space is tracking better. If you're confused, just watch Ian Hubert's tutorial on all of this. Now, as always, let's follow our three beginning steps to recreate our real world in 3D, matching the geometry, lighting, and materials. Now, since the hole we're adding isn't going to cast any light or shadows onto the existing scene, we don't really need to recreate much geometry here. Let's just start by creating our wall with some thickness. For the lighting, I captured two HDRIs, one for each side of the wall. Then in my environment shader, I added in both HDRIs and created a checker texture so that half the environment is black and half white. Then I used this as the factor input for a mix shader so that half my environment is one HDRI, half is the other. In matching the materials, well, we aren't really recreating any materials from our real footage, so we'll move on. Okay, now we have the general setup. Let's focus on creating our hole. First, create a cylinder and place it around the area where you want your hole to be. Now click on your wall object, go into the modifiers tab and add a boolean modifier. Set it to difference and select the cylinder object. Now if we hide the cylinder, we have a hole. With any effect you do, look for reference photos. If I look at real holes in drywall, I can note the thickness of the wall, the main white layer, and then some brown paper that's just below the paint. Let's try to improve our geometry first to match this reference. Turn the cylinder back on and scale it down like so. Then we'll add a subsurface modifier to give it more faces. Add some edge loops to either end, and then I added three different displacement modifiers. I set up the first modifier with these settings and this texture. Here's the second modifier with a different texture, and the third modifier is exactly the same as the second with just the direction changed to Z. Now, if we hide the cylinder again, we'll notice a much nicer cutout look. Sometimes this boolean can be buggy and not cut out the hole properly. If that's the case, just tweak your texture values or position or scale of the cylinder till the hole shows up. And since all our displacement modifiers are based on procedural textures, we can change any texture settings and thus change the look of the hole very easily. Now I'm going to duplicate this cylinder and I'll flip this one around and offset it a bit. Add another boolean modifier to the wall and select this new cylinder. This just helps add even more variation and randomness to the hole. Now let's add some texture. We're going to create this look using just one material. So create a new material, go into the shader editor view and make sure you're in object mode. We can set our 3D view to material preview to see our changes. For the white part of the drywall, I'm in a material setup like this. For the brown part, there's a similar setup, mainly some different colors. Sorry, I really don't wanna explain those parts. I just honestly don't like making materials that much and this video will be long enough as is. Now we have the different materials finished. Let's assign them to the correct parts of the wall. First, we know that any interior part of this hole should have the white drywall material applied to it. If we add a geometry node and control shift and click on back facing, we can see that this selects those exact faces. If you're not seeing this, select your wall, go into edit mode, go to select all, then go to mesh, normals, flip. Hopefully now you'll see that back facing selection. Now we can use this as a mask. We'll color invert this mask so that the hole is white. Then create a mix shader, plug our white drywall in the bottom, our brown ripped look in the middle, and our back facing mask in the top. Now you'll see we have our drywall just on those interior faces and the rest of the wall is brown. Now let's define where that brown texture should cut off so it doesn't cover the whole wall. In my setup, I had a gradient texture node set to spherical. Click on this and hit Ctrl plus T to automatically generate a texture coordinate and mapping node. We'll want to choose object and then select our cylinder object here. 
Now you'll see we have a white circle around our hole. And if we move our cylinder object, say to reposition our hole, the circle will stick with it. From here, let's add a Musgrave texture node and we'll create a mapping node for it as well. Here are my settings for the Musgrave texture. Now, if I take the spherical gradient, I can multiply it by the Musgrave texture to just get some noise around the hole. From there, I can multiply that value by some higher value to raise the brightness. Now, if I use a greater than node, I can adjust the bottom value to essentially clip our texture so it's not so soft and feathered. Now, we want the white drywall to follow this rippled line. So I'll duplicate this greater than node and lower the value slightly. Now if I add this to our previous mask and update the factor on that mix shader, you'll see that our drywall expands onto the flat surface of the wall. This helps to blend those edges a little bit. Now we'll get that brown part to be masked out similarly. To do so, we'll take this expanded mask and add it to our other one. We'll create another mix shader and use this in the factor input. Finally, create a holdout shader and put it in the top slot and the other mix shader in the bottom. This holdout shader makes everything behind it transparent, which is great because it will allow us to see the original footage everywhere except for where the hole is. Since this material is completely based on procedural textures, I can go back to any texture or mapping nodes and play with the different values to get different looks. I want to thank my boy CG Matter for helping me develop this material setup. Okay. Now we have one hole set up, I'll duplicate my wall with the two cylinders and I'll just bring this duplicate back a little. Perhaps rotate the cylinders to make the second hole a bit different and make sure to update your Boolean settings for this second wall to use those new cylinders. We don't want this interior wall to have that holdout material on it. So we'll just make a copy of this material and we'll change that holdout to be a material that looks like the dark brown paper that we see on the inside of our reference image. Finally, I created these wood beams with a simple wood texture applied. To splinter one of the wood beams, I created a UV sphere, move it into place, added a subdivision modifier, add a displaced modifier in the Z direction, and then add a noise texture. Set the wood beam to have a boolean difference modifier like we did with our holes, and select the sphere for our object. Now hide the sphere and you get a splintered beam. Now the hole is finished. Let's take all these elements so far and put them in their own collection called wall. Within this collection, I'll put the cylinder objects in their own collections so I can turn them on and off so they don't show in our render. Now you have different options for how you can achieve what's on the other side of the hole. If what's on the other side is farther away or your camera doesn't move too much, then you might be able to get away with simple 2D images projected onto planes. You'll see I tried this technique in my original draft but my camera just moves too much where it's obvious that I have a 2D image. So for my scene, I actually went ahead and modeled some of the room, but mainly just the parts I would see through the hole. If you suck at modeling like me, you can also find some models on BlendSwap and use whatever you can find to make your own made up room. I then placed all these objects in a collection called Room. Okay, so you might be tempted to hit render, go into the compositor, bring in the footage, do a simple alpha overnode and boom, effect finished. But I want you to resist this temptation and I'll show you how a more professional workflow would look. You see, in high-end VFX, you might have several different people working on a single shot. After modeling, lighting and materials comes rendering. Then the shot is handed off to the compositor. Now rendering as you know takes a lot of time. So the goal is to give the compositor as much flexibility to make adjustments to the scene to prevent re-rendering. If we handed the compositor just what we have now and the client says, that hole, it looks too dark, I hate it. The compositor would be like, because he really has no way to make this adjustment specifically to the hole, but to go back to the material and lighting person and then have them make the changes and then re-render. So it's a bad workflow for professionals and it's a bad workflow for us. So let's see how to avoid this. The first thing we'll do to give ourselves flexibility in the composite is to render our hole and background room in different view layers. So let's use this current view layer and name it hole. We'll set our room collection to indirect only so it only indirectly impacts our wall. Now we'll create another view layer and name this one background. In this view layer, we'll set the wall collection to indirect only. Now you might be wondering why we don't set this to hold out. You might argue that this cuts down on the render time by only rendering what we see through the hole. You'll see why we're not doing this a little bit later. Now another way to give our compositor as much flexibility as possible is to provide her with render passes. When we render an image, by default, we have a combined pass or sometimes called a beauty pass. 
Render passes give us a way to extract different light information that goes into making this combined pass. This gives us more control over how the image looks without the need to re-render. I've said this before, but Blender Cycles has a master equation of how to recreate our combined pass, our final image, by combining all the other render passes. So let's enable these render passes to give our compositor as much flexibility as possible. In the whole view layer, I'm going to leave the default passes and enable the object crypto mat data pass. For the background view layer, we'll enable all these passes. Make sure the background is transparent and hit render and let these two view layers render out. Ahora compongamos. As always, let's enable use nodes in background. We'll delete everything and add a viewer node and composite output node. Add an image input node and bring in our background footage. Control shift and click to view this node and we'll add a distort scale node to make sure it matches our render size. Now bring in a render layers node. Again, render layers and view layers mean the same thing. We'll see in this node we can select either view layer and we can view all the different render passes that were enabled. Okay, hopefully I'm about to blow your mind. Hang with me. First, let's combine our render passes for the background, following the diagram we're provided. First, we see that we add together the direct and indirect passes, so we'll create color mix nodes set to add, and add together each direct and indirect pass. Then we see that we multiply the color information by our previous result. So we'll create a color mix node set to multiply, and multiply the color by the output of our add nodes. Finally, our diagram shows that everything is then added together to get the final combined pass. We can't really add everything together in one node, so we'll have to use a few different add nodes like this. Now you can kind of see how this node setup resembles this diagram. If I click between this output and the image output, you'll see that we have, in fact, recreated it perfectly. We can also view the different lighting components or ingredients of our final image. First is all the diffuse information. Next, the glossy info, then the transmission information. If you're confused about what these terms mean, I've created a free infographic with a section on different types of light rays in Blender, linked in the description. So we have all this set up, so what? Well, say we want just the reflections to be brighter and stronger. Well, we can simply add an RGB curves node to our composite just before we add in our glossy information. Now you'll see if we change this curves, we're affecting only the glossy reflective parts. Say we just want to apply these curves to our TV. Well, this is where our object crypto mat pass comes in. Let's duplicate this render layers node. We'll create a crypto mat node and attach the three crypto object outputs to the inputs in the correct order. Then plug in our image. To use this node, we want to control shift and click on the pick output. From here, we can see all the different objects that we can create masks of just in slightly different colors. We'll use the color picker here and select our TV. Now that we've done this, we can see in our mask output that we have just the TV masked out. We'll use this output as the factor input for that curves node we created. Now we can see that we can adjust the brightness of the reflections on the TV alone. Do you feel the power? Uh, okay, so say we maybe want to change the brightness of our lamp here. Well, let's duplicate our crypto mat setup. We'll erase the previous selection by deleting this text. Then go to the pick output and select the lamp. We'll add a curves node to our transmission component of our composite. Our light coming through the shade is in the transmission pass since this light is transmitting through the shade surface. We can then use the object mat in the factor input and now we have control over the lamp brightness and color. Easy as that, no re-rendering necessary. Now that we have our background composited, let's composite in our original footage. To do this, we'll need to use the object crypto mat from our whole view layer. So let's create another render layers node, select our whole view layer and connect another crypto mat node. Now we can use the pick output and click a few times to select all the objects, including the wood beams. Create an alpha over node, put the footage in the bottom input, the background in the middle input, and then our wall mat in the factor input. Now we'll see that our mat isn't covering enough area since our wall geometry doesn't cover the whole screen. This is an easy fix if we go into the masking tab, create a square mask, animate it over the course of the shot to roughly surround the hole, then in the compositor again, add in a mask node, select the mask we created, We'll need to invert it and then add this result to the other mask. Then this will update the factor input of the alpha over node. Now let's add in the hole. 
This is pretty simple. Just add a render layers node with the whole view layer selected. Add an alpha over node with the hole in the bottom, previous comp in the middle, and there you go. For the whole view layer, we could have enabled all the render passes like we did for the background, but instead we'll use the combined pass to keep this tutorial short. Now your hole probably covers a lot, if not all of the tracking markers you placed on the wall. For any markers left over, I used CG Geek's marker removal technique seen at the end of his tutorial. I'll link that in the description. Now if you're making this shot for yourself and you're happy with the composite, you can just connect your final composite node, set an output type of PNG, and hit render animation. But let me show you a more professional workflow. I would enable only the background view layer to render by disabling the whole view layer. Make sure you have a render layers node set to the background view layer connected to the composite output in the compositor. Then select Open EXR Multi-Layer File and hit Render Animation. This will give me an image sequence of just the background. I would then do the same for the whole view layer, enabling only it to render out, changing that view layer in the compositor, select a different file output location, and render everything out. So we've rendered out two Open EXR sequences, one for each view layer. Now we can go back into our compositor and add in these sequences by creating an image input node. For the background, I'll simply replace any of my background render layer nodes with the open EXR sequence, updating all the inputs. Don't forget to update those crypto mats as well. Same thing for the hole, we can replace the render layers node with the open EXR sequence we made. By rendering everything out to open EXR multi-layer files, we're creating full resolution renders while retaining the render pass information so we can still make changes. And now that we have full sequences in our compositor, we can move to different parts of the timeline and view different frames without re-rendering. Now from here, make sure everything is in the composite node, select an output type of PNG. Now we want Blender to run through this compositing graph and compile the final image, but we don't really want to render anything new from the actual 3D scene. So a weird workaround to do this is to create another view layer, disable all the collections but the one with your scene camera in it. Make sure only this view layer is enabled for rendering, set the samples to one. Now, if we hit render animation, Blender will compile everything in our compositor graph. Now, what if the client says something like, now I, I need that hole to be higher on the wall, it must be dominant in the shot. Well, then you would say, not a problem, uh, Mr. Client. This, this is no problem at all. I will move the hole higher immediately. So you go into the scene, move the hole elements, and then just render out a new OpenEXR multi-layer sequence for just the whole view layer. The key thing here is that we avoid re-rendering the background view layer. That remains unchanged since we originally rendered it out without any masks. If we had instead only rendered out what we saw of the background through the hole, then we would have to re-render the background. So that's why we chose to render out the entire background for flexibility in our workflow and ease of making changes. Now to finish the composite, I added some blurring to the background since it's farther away and some other color adjustments. Now you have a hole in the wall. Is there an effect or technique you wanna see in the next tutorial? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. New this month, I'd like to start sharing some work that inspires me. This month's feature is a really awesome, fully CG car ad made mostly in Blender by the very talented Daniel Vesterbake. I have links to this video along with great behind the scenes tutorials he made in the description. Remember, you can get the project files for this tutorial over on my Patreon. Thanks to all the patrons who are supporting me so far, you all rock. Other than that, I wanted to thank you for watching, commenting, subscribing, dinging that bell, and I'll see you in the next one.